Hello again. <clears throat> Good evening from the city of Kovola in southeastern Finland, northern Europe. I tried to fairly briefly recall an event that happened exactly eight years ago. That enjoyable day, summer day for many, summer holiday. On July the 22nd, 2011, was crashed or crushed, shattered into a day of grief, shock, horror, and anger. A 32-year-old Norwegian right-wing extremist, a terrorist, a self-described uh, cultural Christian, and a self-described supposed defender of Europe's Christian culture. Mr. Anders Bering Breivik perpetrated two terrorist attacks in Norway. The first one in the center of Oslo, Norway's capital, in the block uh, where the government headquarters or he uh, government uh, buildings are located. He planted a time bomb inside a car, which of course was destroyed, and in the mayhem, eight people were killed. Then he was able to, disguised as a police officer, uh, travel by a motor boat to the island of Utøya, which I think in English means outer island, outside Oslo, where the Social Democratic uh, Norwegian Labour Party was holding its um, annual summer camp for its young members. <clears throat> and there he was able to shoot 69 people, bringing the total number of dead to 77 people before he was then forced to surrender by the police officers who finally arrived to Utøya. A number of questions have been raised as to how this was possible. Well, of course, in this wicked and sinful world, many kinds of events nowadays in the 21st century, which still in the so-called safe or safest countries in the world, including Norway, Sweden and Finland and Denmark, uh, were thought unthinkable still, especially before the 1980s and 1990s, are now possible. And as a Bible-believing Christian, I believe that these are among the negative signs of the end times, the approaching second coming of Jesus Christ, and of course that showdown between Jesus Christ and Satan, uh, which will culminate <clears throat> in the uh, Battle of Armageddon at the end of the seven or three and a half year tribulation period and uh, the reign of Antichrist, Satan's embodiment on the earth. And then there will be the 1000 year kingdom of peace known as the millennial kingdom. Then Satan will be loosed for a brief period, maybe only days, hopefully only days, in his final vain attempt at uh, um, winning control of the universe away from God. It will end in a miserable failure. And then uh, time as we know it will pass into history, there will, will be the last judgment, and then eternal heaven for those who by God's grace uh, will be counted among the saved, and then eternal hell, unfortunately, for the others. So what I'm about to say about Mr. Breivik is not intended to be a personal attack against him. I deeply grieved, I deeply grieve that he has such um, a skewed, perverted personality. I'm so sad that he has so greatly abused the wonderful gifts, including in intellect and organizational ability given to him by God. And I'm so sad that he still remains these eight years later unrepentant of his crimes. He's very likely to end up spending the rest of his life behind bars, barring, of course, such a radical change as a genuine and lasting <clears throat> Christian conversion, which would eliminate his personality 
um, flaws such as that narcissism uh, and the inability or, and or unwillingness to feel sorry for the people who are hurting and to feel true remorse over these horrible crimes. But should he become a born-again Christian like a Finnish um, still nominally incarcerated prisoner, Mr. Lauri Johansson had, has, I mean, he became a Christian while in prison in November 2007. After that, he confessed two until then unsolved homicides. He was given an additional sentence, but because of his genuine Christian beliefs and his uh, profound feeling of remorse for the crimes he committed earlier in life, he's scheduled to be released on June the 1st, 2020. Glory to God. But let's get back to Mr. Breivik. He was honest enough in his manifesto, Europe 2083 or something like that, to admit that possibly he did not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and he definitely did not at the time of those attacks. But he called himself instead a cultural Christian, and he supposedly uh, thought that the ends justified the means, or justify the means. In other words, that these horrible terrorist attacks were necessary to accomplish the means of protecting Europe's Christian culture. Truly born-again Christians, whether in Europe or elsewhere, believe that the Christian faith is best defended by those who no, not only profess a certain set of Christian beliefs and doctrines, but who also practice their Christian uh, faith in daily life, who evangelize people, disciple them, uh, pray for them, who show genuine Christian love and caring, compassion, forgiveness, and patience to them. And do it, of course, honestly and righteously. Such people will end up winning by the end of time a stunning number of people for Jesus Christ. So let's get to Mr. Breivik then. Who is he? Well, he was born in February 1979 in Oslo, the Norwegian capital. So he's now 40 years old. Since 2017, he has legally changed his name to, to Fjutolf Hansen. This is the practice of certain long-term prisoners. Here in Finland, we have a prisoner called, or former prisoner now, called Juha Valjakka. Who in 1988, with his then uh, girlfriend, um, Miss Marita Rotalami murdered a th um, a three members out of a four, three people out of a four-member uh, Swedish family uh, in the northern Swedish uh, village of Omsele. He had first stolen uh, a motorcycle from that family. I'm sorry, a bicycle from that family at night. And then the father of the family, 49-year-old Stan Nilsson, and his 16-year-old son, Fredrik, uh, started to chase Mr. Valjakkala. And then they uh, ended up in the local graveyard where Mr. Valjakkala forced them uh, to kneel, uh, threatening them with a shotgun. First, he uh, shot fatally Stan. Then Frederick uh, tried to plead for his life by lying about his age. Regardless, Mr. Valjakla shot him. And then uh, the 42-year-old mother of the family, Eva, Mrs. Eva Nielsen, went to look what had happened. He saw that Mr. Valjakla was sitting in their family car and knocked on the window. Uh, Valjakla then uh, thrust the door open so uh, fiercely that Eva fell, but then was able to uh, start running. Uh, Valjakala caught her and um, hit her so powerfully with his shotgun that it was shattered, and then he stabbed Eva to death. 
by slashing her throat open. Um, and then Miss Rotalammi uh, was eventually freed. Um, after serving half of her sentence, uh, Valiakkala is uh, barred for the rest of his life from ever visiting Sweden again. As for Mr. Valiakkala himself, uh, he was released finally in 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 was it 2008 or then later but he has been in trouble with the law um, after that uh, for driving a vehicle driving a car under the influence of alcohol for shoplifting uh, for aggravated assault aggravated driving under the influence of alcohol and so forth. So it seems that it's quite difficult for him to break this pattern of, uh, of crimes. Uh, in January 2019, he uh, was caught uh, trying to break into a restaurant in Helsinki uh, to snatch alcohol. And his current name is now Nikita Bergenström. But let's get back to Mr. Breivik now. So in July 2012, he was convicted of mass murder, causing a fatal explosion and terrorism. He had been arrested as a juvenile and had been rejected from the Norwegian army. Norway, at least uh, at that time, still had conscription, although uh, after one month, Norway at least has had the practice of allowing the conscripts uh, two choices, whether to continue uh, this national service or military service as a military service or whether to switch to the civilian alternative service. At the age of 20, so in or around 1999, he joined the right-wing populist and anti-immigration progress party, but he left it in 2006. On the day of the attack, so July the 22nd, 2011, he electronically distributed a compendium of, compendium of texts entitled 2083, a European Declaration of Independence, describing his militant ideology. In them, he stated his opposition to Islam and blamed feminism for European cultural suicide. The text demanded that all the Muslims be deported from Europe. He also wrote that his main motive for the attacks was to publicize his manifesto. Two teams of court-appointed forensic psychiatrists examined Breivik before his trial. The first team diagnosed with, uh, with paranoid schizophrenia, but after this initial finding was criticized, a second evaluation concluded that he was not psychotic during the attacks, but did have a narcissistic personality, personality disorder and an antisocial personality disorder. His trial began in April 2012, and in August 2012, predictably, the Oslo District Court found him sane and guilty of murdering those 77 people. He was sentenced to 21 years in prison, which is the Norwegian equivalent of life imprisonment. However, there is a catch. Um, because he's considered dangerous to the public, uh, should he ever reach 
uh, 21 years in prison, his uh, life imprisonment can be extended by five years at a time, unless or until he is deemed safe enough to be released. In Finland, by contrast, life imprisonment usually means uh, between 12 and 14 years in prison unless the offender is considered extremely dangerous to the public. So, um, according to Mr. Breidik's sentence, he has to be incarcerated for a minimum of 10 years, and there can be more one or more extensions for as long as he is deemed a danger to society. Mr. Breidik announced unrepentantly that he did not recognize the court's legitimacy, well, reminds me of the late and executed Romanian communist dictator, Mr. Nicolae Ceausescu, who in his trial and that of his wife, Elena, repeatedly declared on Christmas Day, December the 25th, 1989, Nu recunosc I don't recognize the court. And therefore did not accept its decision. He claimed that he supposedly could not appeal because this would legitimize the Oslo District Court's authority. In 2016, Mr. Breivik sued the Norwegian Correctional Service, claiming that his solitary confinement supposedly violated his human rights. A subsequent court ruling found that his rights had not been violated despite an earlier ruling, and in June 2017, Breivik filed a complaint with the European Court of Human Rights which dismissed his case in June 2018. Since his imprisonment, Mr. Breivik has identified himself as a fascist and a Nazi who practices Odinism, a form of ancient Scandinavian or Nordic religion, because Odin or Udin was considered the main god in that religion, and uses counter-jihadist rhetoric to support ethno-nationalists. So his family name is Breivik, while Bering, Bering, his mother's maiden name, is his middle name and not part of the family name. In June 2017, Vardens Gang, one of Norway's major daily newspapers, reported that Breivik had changed his legal name to Fjutolf Hansen. He was born in Oslo in February 1979, the son of uh, Venshke. Uh, Bering, who lived from 1946 to 2013, uh, a nurse, so his mother, and Jens David Breivik, born in 1935, a civil economist who worked as a diplomat for the Norwegian embassy in London and later in Paris. His father, who later married a diplomat, fought for but failed to achieve uh, custody. His parents divorced when he was a year old, so probably 1980. When Breivik was four, so probably 1983, living in Fritzner's Gate in Oslo, two reports were filed expressing concern about his mental health, concluding that he ought to be removed from parental care. A psychologist in one of the reports noted the boy's peculiar smile, suggesting it was not anchored in his emotions, but was rather a deliberate response to his environment. Breivik lived with his mother and his half-sister in the west end of Oslo and regularly visited his father and stepmother in France until they divorced when he was 12, so uh, in or around 1993, 1991. Sorry. He chose to be confirmed into the Lutheran Church of Norway, which is the state church there, uh, while Norway has a very wide degree of religious freedom the Evangelical Lutheran Church there has a special status, as it does also in Iceland, Denmark, and Finland, but no longer officially in Sweden, where the uh, church and state were officially separated, I think, either in 1999 or 2000. At the age of 15, so in 1994. As an adolescent, uh, he was described to have become rebellious in his behavior. In his early teen years, so 
in the early 1990s. He was a prolific graffiti artist, part of Oslo West's hip hop community. According to Mr. Breidik's mother, when he, after he was caught uh, spraying graffiti on walls in 1995 at the age of 16 and fined, his father stopped uh, contacting him. They have not been in contact since then. Breidik's father, however, claims that it was his son who broke off contact with him and that he would always have welcomed Anders despite his destructive activities. Since adolescence, Mr. Breidik had spent much time on weight training and started using anabolic steroids. He cared a lot about his physical appearance and about appearing big and strong. He has criticized his parents for supporting the policies of the Social Democratic Norwegian Labour Party and his mother for being, in his opinion, a moderate feminist. Um, he attended the Smestad Grammar School, Ries Junior High, Hartvig Nissens Upper Secondary School, and Oslo Commerce School, graduating from the uh, last mentioned institution in 1998. A former classmate has recalled that Mr. Breidik was an intelligent student, physically stronger than his age mates, and often took care of people who were bullied. Um, the Norwegian Defense Security Department, which conducts the vetting process for the nation's military service for young men, um, considered Mr. Breivik unfit for service at the mandatory conscript assessment. After the age of 21, so after 2000, Breivik was in the customer service department <coughs> of an unnamed company working with people from all countries and being kind to everyone. A former co-worker described him as an exceptional colleague and a close friend of his said he usually had a big ego and would be easily irritated by those of Arab or South Asian origin. According to a Biela Russian or white Russian opposition figure, Mr. Mikhail Reshetnikov, Mr. Breivik underwent paramilitary training in a camp organized by retired KGB colonel, Mr. Valery Lunyev. He claimed that in 2002, at the age of 23, he had started a nine-year plan to finance the 2011 attacks, founding his own computer programming business while working at the customer service company. According to him, his company grew to six employees and several offshore bank accounts, and he made his first million kroner, kroner is still, or krone is still the Norwegian currency at the age of 24. He wrote in his manifesto that he supposedly lost 2 million crowns on stock speculation, but still had about 2 million crowns to finance the attack. The company was later declared bankrupt and Mr. Breidik was reported for several breaches of the law. In 2010, he visited Prague, the Czech Republic's capital in Eastern Central Europe, in an attempt to buy illegal weapons but he couldn't buy there a weapon, uh, a weapon there and decided to get weapons through legal channels in Norway instead. Buying one semi-automatic 9mm Glock 34 pistol legally by demonstrating his membership in a pistol club in the police application for a gun license and the semi-automatic uh, Roger spelled R-U-G-E-R I don't know if it should be pronounced Roger or Rougar or something else, or Rouget, mini-14 rifle by possessing a hunting license. He had no declared income in 2009, and his assets amounted to 390,000 Norwegian crowns, or 72,063 US dollars, according to Norwegian tax authority figures. He stated that in January 2010, his uh, funds were depleting gradually. On June the 23rd, 2011, a month before the attacks, he paid the outstanding amount on his nine credit cards so he could have access to funds during his preparations. In either late June or early July 2011, he moved to a rural area south of 
Osta in Omut, Hedmark County or province, about 140 kilometers northeast of Oslo, the site of his farm. As he admits in his manifesto, he used the company as a cover to legally obtain large amounts of artificial fertilizer and other chemicals for the manufacturing of explosives. Breivik's farmer neighbor described him as looking like a city dweller who wore expensive shirts and who knew nothing about rural ways. He also covered his house's windows. <clears throat> so the timeline of the attacks went as follows. At approximately um, 3.25 p.m. <clears throat> local time, uh, his car bomb exploded in Oslo within the Norwegian government's main building's uh, block. It killed eight people and injured at least 209 people, 12 of them severely. Uh, on the island of Utøya, between 5.22 and, and uh, 6.34 p.m. local time, he killed 69 people and injured at least 110, 55 of them seriously. Among the dead were friends of the <clears throat> then Norwegian prime minister or head, head of government, Mr. Jens Stoltenberg, and the stepbrother of Norway's crown princess, Mette Marit. The attack was the deadliest one in Norway since the Second World War, and we remember that for most of that war, Norway was occupied by Germany. And the shooting at Utøya remains the deadliest mass shooting by a lone perpetrator in recent history. A survey found that one in Norwegians knew someone who had been affected by the shootings. When the public force counterterrorism unit based in Oslo finally arrived to the island, and confronted him, he surrendered without resistance. And there has been some controversy about why the response was so slow. Um, Mr. Breivik started his massacre at 5.22 p.m. Although the emergency medical services were informed about the shooting at 5.24 p.m., just two minutes later, and the police in Oslo were informed at 5.25 p.m. They did not have a helicopter that could have taken them straight to the island. Had they been able to reach the island quickly, they could have saved tens of lives. Although in the process, I'm afraid that at least a few police officers might have been either killed or seriously injured. By 5.30 p.m., the anti-terror police in Oslo or the emergency response unit were on the way to Utøya by car. One of the first to arrive on the scene was Mr. Marcel, Marcel Gleffe, a German resident of Ski or Ski, uh, staying at Utvika camping on the mainland. He recognized gunshots and piloted his boats to the island and started to throw life jackets to young people in the water rescuing as many as he could in four or five trips, after which the police asked him to stop. According to the Daily Telegraph, he saved up to 30 lives. Another 40 were saved by Hege Dalen and Turil Hansen, a married couple um, on vacation in the area. Dalen was helping from land while Hansen and a neighbor camper made several trips to rescue people in the water. Several dozen more were rescued by Kasper Ilaug, who made three trips to the island. He lived at, at the time uh, near Utøya and had received <clears throat> a telephone call that something terrible was happening there and uh, that help was needed. Initially, he thought that the caller was joking, but he acted anyway. Some 150 people swam away from the island were pull, uh, pulled out of the lake by campers on the opposite shore. At 6.09 p.m., the anti-terror police reached the meeting point but had to wait a few minutes for a boat to take them across. They finally reached Utøya at 6.25 p.m., but during those 
that hour, uh, 69 people had been shot dead on the island. And no wonder there are no conspiracy theories according to which someone in the Norwegian police's headquarters deliberately delayed the response. Well, God, of course, knows the truth of the matter. It looks as if there were a series of unfortunate, innocent mistakes that simply the Norwegian police had not prepared for such a sudden attack. And in July at that, when most Norwegians who, by God's grace, uh, have a regular job uh, or are at school are on vacation. And also here in Finland, July is still the favorite vacation month for people. Summer holiday month, that is. When confronted by the heavily armed police on the island, Mr. Breivik initially hesitated for a few seconds. When an officer yelled surrender or be shot, he laid down his weapon. So he refused to be idolized as a martyr because had he done that, he would have resisted and probably he would have lost his life in the process. But he wants to be a living idol to fellow right-wing uh, extremist, uh, extremists and terrorists. He had called the 112 emergency phone number at least twice to surrender at 6.01 p.m. and at 6.26 p.m. and had continued killing people in between. The police say Brady hung up both times. They tried to call him back, but it did not succeed. So during the attack, 69 people were killed in Utøya, and of the 517 survivors, 66 were wounded. The Norwegian police tragically did, did not have helicopters suitable for transporting groups of police for an airdrop. Or they still don't have, at least at the time of this uh, Wikipedia article's latest editing, and they should have. The one they have is useful only for surveillance and the helicopter crew were, tragically, on holiday. When the local police arrived at Utøykaya, less than 30 minutes after the first shot was fired, they could not find a suitable boat to reach the island. They were then ordered to observe <clears throat> and report. Uh, the uh, Norwegian Labour Party's youth uh, wing's own ferry, the 50-passenger MS Turbjörn, was used by Mr. Breivik to go, go to Utøya. Shortly after the first shot was fired, nine people were leaving the island on the ferry, among them uh, this organization's leader, Mr. Eskil Pedersen. They feared there might be more terrorists in the area and navigated the ferry 2.7 kilometers to the north. And therefore, tragically, the ferry was not available to the police when they finally arrived at Utøya the normal ferry landing on the mainland. The police therefore had to use their own rigid hulled inflatable boat. And on the day when these tragic terrorist attacks happened, this boat was located in Hörnefoss and had to be transported to the lake and launched before it could be used. When the anti-terror police boarded the RHIB, it took on some water and after a few hundred meters, the engine stopped probably due to water in the fuel. Two minutes later, they took over a civilian boat that was sent to assist them. The episode was captured on video. A minute or two after the video ended, a faster civilian boat arrived to help. Four police officers from the anti-terror police boarded the boat. Some have criticized the police for not using a helicopter for not immediately getting into small boats and for endangering the couple who drove the civilian boat. After arriving to Utøya, the police arrested, in addition to Breivik, Mr. Anzor Jukayev, an innocent 17-year-old survivor who represented the Akersus branch of the Labour Party's youth wing or organization. The youth was reportedly stripped naked and locked up in a jail cell located only meters away from the cell housing the self-confessed killer. The victim, who as a child had witnessed mass murders in Chechnya, in the Caucasus region, was suspected of being an accomplice because of his haircut was different from that shown on his identity document, 
and because he did not react to the carnage with the same tears and hysteria as most of the other survivors. He was kept in custody for 17 hours. His lawyer, Mr. Harald Stabel, criticized the police for failing to contact the youth's family who feared he was killed and for interrogating him without a lawyer being present. So in Oslo, the ages of those killed, uh, one was in his or her 20s, three were in their 30s, two were in their 50s, one was in his or her 60s. And then in Utøya, two 14-year-olds were killed, so they had been born either in 1996 or 1997. Seven 15-year-olds, eight 16-year-olds, 16 17-year-olds, 17 18-year-olds, five 19-year-olds, one 20-year-old, three 21-year-olds, two 23-year-olds, and then one each from the following age, uh, ages 25, 27, 28, 30, 45, and 51 were killed. In addition to them, uh, two 43-year-olds were killed. So any updates on, and or obviously since then, the Norwegian police and security forces uh, and army, of course, uh, have instituted much stricter security measures in order to at least radically minimize the possibility of copycat attacks in their otherwise usually peaceful country. So in March 2013, Mr. Breivik's mother <clears throat> died from complications from cancer. And on the same day, March the 23rd, 2013, me the media said that uh, she and her son uh, took farewell during a meeting at Ila last week. Breivik was permitted to move himself out from behind the glass wall of the visit room to give his mother a farewell hug. He had asked for permission by the prison officials to attend his mother's funeral service, but the request was rejected. In an essay called Right-Wing Terrorism as Folk Activism, alternate right philosopher Curtis Yarvin wrote about Breivik. No one who condones Che, meaning Che Guevara, Stalin, Mao, or any other leftist murderer has any right to ask anyone else to dissociate himself from a rightist who didn't even make triple digits, so didn't murder more than 100 people. The Australia-born terrorist Brenton Harrison Tarrant, who killed 51 people, all Muslims, and injured 50 more during the Christchurch mosque shootings at Al Noor Mosque and Linwood Islamic Center in Christchurch, New Zealand in March 2019, mentioned Mr. Breivik in his manifesto, The Great Replacement, as one of the far-right mass murderers and killers he supports and said, but only really took true, true inspiration from Knight Justicer Breivik, even going as far as to claim brief contact with him and his organization, Knights Templar. Mr. Breivik claims that he prays and sacrifices to this ancient mythical Scandinavian or Nordic or Germanic god Odin and, and describes his religion as Odinism. However, in his manifesto, he claimed to have prayed to God in the days leading up to the attack. He was an active member of an Oslo shooting club between 2005 and 2007, and from 2010 to 11. At the time of the attacks, he belonged to the Lodge of St. Olaf at the Three Columns in Oslo, in other words, to a free Masonic lodge. And uh, the Grand Master of the Norwegian Order of Freemasons, Mr. Ivar Skar, or Skor, 
immediately uh, excluded him from the fraternity based upon the acts he carried out and the values that appear to have motivated them. And as I said, he was a member of the right-wing populist and largely anti-immigration Progress Party from 1999 to 2006. After the attack, predictably, this party immediately distanced itself from Breivik's actions and ideas. He claimed that he had contact with the far-right English Defence League, a movement in Britain that has been accused of Islamophobia. And the Knights Templar, he claims to have uh, had contact with them. Let's hope and pray that never again will such devastating attacks happen if that were if it were possible to prevent them.